Es un placer hoy contar a, aquí con nosotras y con nosotros, con estas a, tres invitadas magníficas, a, en esta mesa que hemos llamado a, Internet, digamos la regulación de Internet como, como campo de batalla. Como sabéis, estamos dedicando esta edición del Decidim Fest a, al futuro de Internet y a los retos que tiene Internet en su futuro sobre su gobernanza, sobre su capacidad de defender a su naturaleza democrática y muchas veces nos olvidamos de la parte de la regulación, que es la que pone las normas y la que en un momento dado a, puede defender nuestros derechos. Y tenemos a, a expertas de altísimo nivel para, tra, para que han trabajado esta cuestión en primera persona, que, con, que conocen este campo de batalla en realidad. Yo, de hecho, pensando no quería entrar en el, en el terreno bélico y a lo mejor más como territorio de conflicto, ¿no? que, que es más interesante y más en tiempos donde no queremos más guerras. ¿no? Entonces, uh, tenemos con nosotros y con nosotras hoy a, a Gilto, uh, que estará online, de Racism and Technology Center. Tenemos a Andrea Rodríguez, de la European Policy Center y también una conocedora de lo que está pasando en términos regulatorios y sobre todo cuál es el papel de los lobbies. Uh, en Europa y en Bruselas en concreto y tenemos a, a Simona Levy, activista uh, de los derechos digitales e impulsora de numerosas iniciativas, incontables iniciativas y proyectos. Un placer uh, tenerte aquí otra vez y nada, empezamos la sesión. Muchísimas gracias. Sí. ¿Es en inglés hoy? Oh. Ah. Porque yo creía que era en inglés. Ah, en inglés, es en inglés. Bueno, lo siento mucho, será en inglés. No sé si vais a entender nada de lo que digo. Because my English will be a moderation in creative English. So, uh, I'm very happy to switch from Spanish to English. And we're going to start. So, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation in this house, which is one of the ninja house of Barcelona for... Uh, Building Together Digital Future. Here in Canodromo there is a lot of a very interesting group uh, that they are um, helping in creating a, a digital and, and in, a future for the internet that is a fair and democratic future. So we are very happy to contribute to the Decidim Fest. And uh, yes, the subject of, of uh, our... Uh, our um, Cómo se llama esto? Uh, of this hour that we spend together is uh, internet as, as a battlefield, and I think uh, I will keep the battlefield because maybe we don't want a war, but there is many people that want to have a war against a democratic internet. So uh, we really have to consider the internet as a battlefield. Um, When uh, I try to explain this to my students uh, uh, often, and I don't think this crowd is like this, but it's important to remember it, that the, in the mainstream narrative, the internet is, uh, we, uh, we, the, the narrative is uh, about the internet is internet like a tool, like something uh, very basic as a tool. But I think the internet is, is a tool, of course, and is a tool that helps us to disintermediate, uh, and, uh, but also is uh, a period of the history because it has changed as the printing press have opened the modern age. I think the digital age is completely another, uh, a new era. Uh, uh, and this is because of the disintermediation that the internet as a tool brought in. But also is a battlefield because when the, we disintermediate, when the intermediary lose their power, there is of course again a fight back and a, a reintermediation. So, after the first age of the internet, which that happened uh, in the very beginning, in which a certain freedom and a new space for the circulation of culture, information for the organization of the people happened, then in a second phase. Uh, we see very big and powerful intermediary uh, occupying this space and pushing together with the old status quo to re-regulate the internet in order to take away the power to the people. So it is very important that we consider the internet a battlefield because every day as we fight for 
human right, we fight also for digital right, which means the human right in the digital sphere. And uh, this is a daily fight. We gain, we lose, and this is what is uh, a bit about this conversation of today. And I have with me two great fighters, uh, two girls that I appreciate very much. We're going to start with uh, Andrea with Andrea Garcia Rodriguez. Andrea Garcia Rodriguez is a uh, leads digital policy analyst at the European Policy Center. She has been a lead researcher of the Global Observatory of Urban Artificial Intelligence and the research and project manager at CIDOP, Barcelona Center for International Affairs. Since 2020, Andrea is also part of the European Cybersecurity Forum Committee. We're going to start with her because she will give us a bit more of a context mm -hmm. uh, of the situation right now on the European level, right? Well, thank you, Simona. Um, I'm, you're gonna, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I need to open my computer for that because I was told that I have little time and I think that the most important thing when you speak to an audience is not naming thousands of regulations, but actually trying to disguise what is the logic behind it. And that's what I'm gonna try to do today. So um, I think that it's really important to see that the world we are at this very right moment, which is October 2022, is completely different than the world of 2019 when the new commission happened. So every five years we have a new team of commissioners that set together, like they set forward a new program and they say, hey, in the next five years this is what I'm going to do in all these domains of regulation, including of course the digital realm of it. So when in 2019 the commission of von der Leyen like, took power, she was like very um, into certain digital topics that they have no relevance right now in today's digital agenda. And I think this is the first message I want to convey to you. The topics that von der Leyen Commission put together, they were topics related to um, the digital gap, about digitalization of services and infrastructures, trying to make businesses go online, they tried to make like, public administrations go online. It was more on the soft side of things, if we want to see it this way. Whereas in 2022, everything has happened. And, and I'm thinking of three specific things. Um, one of them is the forced digitalization because of COVID-19. In 2020, when the world shut down, we all had to go online, meaning schools that didn't have infrastructure before, they had to sell their souls. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it, but um, I just said that, to a certain digital platform saying, hey, I'm going to do this for you for free, because you need a platform in which that it's easy to use, in which you can like, put everything inside, and it has to be right now. No, we don't have time to build it up. We don't have time to engage with the public sector and the private sector and the civil society and everything to try to see how do we do it. Here is it, just install it, it's going to be fine. Right? So this happened in that forced digitalization. The second motive behind is geopolitics. We cannot like, leave this topic aside. And because of two main things. One, like China used to be like the main rival in 2019. Like, like Huawei, like they're going to steal our data, like this is happening. But then also we also had Donald Trump back then. Let's not forget that. So like traditional alliances, we couldn't rely on them anymore from the European perspective. And then we have the third thing coming up, which is the war in Ukraine. And all these three things have impacted the EU's digital agenda and had shaped priorities towards one thing, or actually two things. The first thing is the acceleration. We need to regulate more and faster, which it's it's really nice because you get things moving, things that in the past weren't moving for like so, so long. I'm thinking of, for example, and I know that Simona, she's like very familiar with this piece of regulation, the e-privacy directive. It has been on the pipeline for years and years and years. And it, it was never a priority because other things would be put on top. Time is limited, resources are limited. We need to see like, what are the two or three things that we really want to, fo to focus on. So everything got accelerated. All of a sudden, we need like, more investments in digital infrastructure. We need more investments in absolutely everything. I live in Brussels, and the maximum connection I could get at my place is 150 megabytes per second. It's nothing. <laughs> Come on. I used to have copper wires, and I'm living like, at the heart of Europe. Like Here, when I was living back in Spain, I could, like, I don't know, like, get like 600, or like right now, like one gigabyte. We have like this target 2025, everybody should be able to access one gigabyte. Well, it's a different thing, right? Like there's like lots of disparities within Europe, so that was like the thing. We need to do everything faster. When you do things faster, 
you normally don't do things the right way because you go to the easy things. And that's normally, that's the second uh, message that I wanted to convey because of all these three things I mentioned before, everything be became securitized. That's a word we use in international relations to say when something used to be a matter that we covered under like trade policy or um, I don't know, like anything you want to mention, it all becomes all of a sudden something that we see that it's either life or death. It, it is us or them, and everything started like to be looked under this frame. So all of a sudden we have the, all these like things coming up in Brussels, like we need to, to speak about the security of supply because we're not getting enough semiconductors. There you have it, September 2021, von der Leyen comes out and says, hey, we're going to make a, a chips act because we need chips to be done in Europe. So that's like a priority that was not at the beginning, then all of a sudden it's on the table. February 2022, we have the chips act written down and proposed. Come on, it's five months. Five months is nothing in Brussels. You, it normally takes years. Because before you create a law, you go in consultation with the stakeholders, then you draft it, then you propose it, then that law goes to the parliament and to the council, and each of them review it and debate that law forever. Then they come together and say, hey, this is my version, and this is your version, so let's speak all of us together to see which one is the, is the last version. And then after that process that we call Trilux, in which, of course, civil society and companies can still like propose amendments and debates and blah, 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 all of a sudden, you just, you just approve one thing. So uh, it's interesting that that process that takes like years, all of a sudden we have five months until the proposal and this is going to be probably passed next year. So times have like surely shortened for things that right now are a matter of life or death. So the first thing is security of supply. The second thing was the security of information. And I think that it's, uh, it's really important to speak about it because lots of things can fall in, in this, under this umbrella of security of information. We have uh, lots of um, initiatives about cybersecurity be put on the table. So uh, when the war in Ukraine hit, we were debating about like, this piece called the NISTU Directive, which means that special sectors must, be, must have special cybersecurity requirements, and that's it. But we, we had something called NIS-1. And the thing is that for each state, something could be an essential sector, for another state could be not an essential sector. And in the end, who's, who's going to have a company in a, in a country that is going to require more from that company? If you could like, put that company in the, actually in, the, in the country next to it, that benefits from the same legal, more or less, things, because it's a single market, but you have less requirements. So because of the war in Ukraine, second thing that accelerated the security of information. We need to pass laws on cybersecurity faster. So we have this one. We have another one that is like starting to be debated right now about IoT products. So everything has started to, to, to happen, right? Like pipeline, pipeline, pipeline. And the third thing is the security of knowledge. And I think this is, a, this is also a very important topic because that meant that some things that we took for granted in the past, such as the right to open science, for example, like, okay, I have a paper and I want to discuss it in an international congress, and then everybody from everywhere can come and listen, and then I can just like, continue my research with somebody who's in a different country. Hey, 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 there's strategic value in here. There's like certain things you cannot do anymore with certain people. And I'm thinking, for example, of Brexit. Brexit happened in between, so all of a sudden, some research teams that had a uh, presence in the UK or they were like collaborating with UK universities, they were no longer allowed to do that. UK researchers were expelled from, um, from certain research groups that were like working under European like, funding, but it also happened with researchers from, from Switzerland and other, other countries that are not EU countries. We need to protect what we are doing inside. And that fostered lots of investment in new technologies, but also for European uh, countries. And then the second uh, thing that I want to speak about is like, why are we securitizing everything? Because let's not forget that the European Union is not a political union, it is an economic union. So when we do speak about security, in fact, the EU doesn't have any competences on that. Security is something that belongs to each country. I, Spain, Poland, Germany, I decided what it's a threat to me and the security of my country. And you, European Union, cannot tell me so, because you're a bunch of institutions bound together by treaties that have an economic interest behind, because it's all about like, creating like, something in common 
in terms of economic integration that will like, give us pr prosperity. So when we thought about that, like, there is nothing we could do when it comes to security, but it's still we're speaking about security of things. In the 2022 agenda, the 2021 agenda has nothing to do with the agenda we had in 2019. And then we have another axis, of course, which is like, okay, so security is one thing, but we're the EU. We need to do things in a human way. So there is like this topic that has become super, super big in Brussels, which is trustworthiness. What the hell is this, right? Mm -hmm. And what do we apply it for? And, I, and here I can say three things that probably uh, Simona, she's going to like it. The trustworthiness of digital services. And we speed it up to, to pass like two laws that some people are familiar with, which are the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. Okay, you're big enough. If you're too big for this market, you need to do like certain things because you're too big. And the second thing, is because you're too big, you manage lots of information, and I don't really trust that you're going to manage that in a way that it's going to do good to the public. So we're going to help you in this, and we're going to like tell you that whatever we say that is happening offline and it's illegal, you should be able to remove that content online as soon as possible. And there are like lots of debates in it, but that's basically the, like the idea behind trustworthiness of partnerships. We are not alone. We cannot do things alone. Europe doesn't have an industry, really, when it comes to digital. Europe doesn't have the, the power to, to transform things. So in trustworthiness of partnerships, the problem is that we have looked at other countries we haven't looked inside. And that's something that I really wanted to say, because sometimes when you do a partnership, it would be like easier to engage civil society and like local governments, regional governments, instead of like looking out and signing a treaty with Singapore, South Korea. And uh, I think the first one that was signed with, 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 with Japan, now we have like two other like forums, one with the United States, another one with India. So Europe is expanding when it comes to this. And then my, my question is like trustworthiness of, of protection of digital rights. We have a GDPR review pending. Um, last year, it was like a celebration. It was like the anniversary of GDPR. We need to do something about it. Uh, War in Ukraine, maybe not a priority right now. And then um, we have an, another thing. In Spanish, we say, abrir un melón. Let's <laughs> open the melon here. The new US-EU data transfer agreement that was unveiled a couple of days ago, and that basically said, so the previous the problems that we had with like the, the previous one was that it didn't um, prevent um, U.S. intelligence services to access data. So what Biden did this time was to make an executive order saying, okay, we're going to provide guarantees that the U.S. intelligence services are not going to access European citizens' data. So because of that, a new tr agreement was like put together. Now I think that Max uh, Schrems has uh, really like, created um, an opinion towards that, and he's waiting to see what the European Court of Justice says in this regard. So overall, the two messages that I wanted to to send is that number one, priorities change. And the agenda, it's configured in relation to the context we're in. And the context has changed, and therefore priorities have changed as well. And the second thing is that we are seeing an acceleration of the typical processes of regulation and digital policy making to the extent that I think that we should really stop and see uh, what is happening right now and who's having the voice and who's like actually giving the money to make like certain messages to be put forward. And I'm not sure if I'm going to get in trouble for saying this, but I think that, uh, that those two things as citizens should really like concern us because after all, and, and she said it before, internet is something that is like really into our lives. Cyberspace is something that is like really into our lives and there is no international binding regulation. So um, there's like regulations that in here in the physical space that say if you behave certain way, it's good. If you behave against this like rules and norms, there's going to be consequences. There are no such laws when it comes to, to cyberspace, to internet, because of course it's harder to make everybody agree on that and it's so vast and lawless and borderless that it's like really hard to make the implementation work. So I think this was my contextual brief uh, note on okay. what has happened at the European level. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Thank you very much. Thank you for the word transworthiness. I will use it in my political Aikido against the enemy all the time. <laughs> so thank you very much. And now we, uh, we welcome in, she were around but uh, hiding, yes, we welcome here uh, Jill Toe. 
she, uh, I'm very happy to see her. Uh, she's a co-founder and secretary of the Racism and Technology Center. It's a very pretty new, small group, but very active. She's also a PhD researcher at the Institute for Information Law of the University of Amsterdam. Her interdis interdisciplinary research looks at the intersection of data, technology, labor, and social justice. She, uh, she, she advised the Platform Workers Litigation Project, which aims to empower platform workers in asserting their data right in the context of increasingly prevalent workplace surveillance technology. So, Jill, welcome, and the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. And also, thank, I'm so sorry that I'm not there. I see everyone in uh, T-shirts, um, and that has made me very jealous. <laughs> I am currently based in Amsterdam, where if you look behind me, it's super cloudy. So I genuinely share the sentiment with Simona that I, I wish I was there. Um, so I think, um, thank you so much, Andrea, also for the discussion. Um, I think my discussion will maybe play a little bit with a local context and also a global dimension if it's possible. Um, I think maybe I start a little bit with sharing what the Racism and Tech Center is, so you kind of get a, an idea of, of how it is, what, it, what we do. Um, and so it's a, it's a non-profit based in the Netherlands, uh, Amsterdam, and I co-founded it together with uh, Naomi Appelman and Hans Desvart. Some of you may know him, uh, he was leading Bits of Freedom, uh, also a digital rights um, organization. Uh, based in the Netherlands for a couple of years. Um, I think one of the main aims of, of building the center was very much observing that the anti-racist organizations uh, often tend to not have the capacity or resources or even kind of the idea of thinking about technology and kind of uh, the way technology impacts some of the work that they do. And on the other hand, digital rights organizations, I think, have been focused on issues of privacy, uh, data protection, uh, freedom of expression, which of course are important topics, but also means you're not addressing issues around uh, forms of discrimination, whether it's through race or socioeconomic status. Uh, so part of it was kind of to bridge these two bigger groups of uh, people already doing work on that ground. Um, so I think there are a bunch of different things that, that we do, but in this talk, I think I just want to talk a little bit of grounding um, some of the discussions that we have on a higher level onto, onto communities on the ground. Um, and I want to underscore that time and time again, it has been proven uh, through research, through investigative journalism, through activists, through all the community work, that a lot of the technologies that we use exacerbates uh, existing forms of injustices and also creates uh, new forms of injustices. And this disproportionate affects um, racialized, marginalized groups of people. And this is across many areas from policing to housing, to welfare, to border control, to education, to employment. Um, and so I think I'm going to give just one example uh, for now. Um, and then I, I have obviously many examples that I can talk about. But I'm just going to base it on one example, uh, very much on a case that we're doing and trying to actually draw some of the key, uh, key points out of this, this particular case that we're doing and, and how it maybe relates to the AI Act um, or regulation in general. Um, so at the moment, um, we are helping a student. So this is on the case of um, online proctoring and, and education surveillance. And we are currently supporting a master's student who was discriminated by Proctorio, a proctoring software. I'm not sure how familiar the crowd is with, I'm guessing it is quite a, a crowd that knows these things, but very briefly, online proctoring uh, uses technologies like facial recognition to detect cheating based on char characteristics of a person and the room. Um, and these technologies through, through research have, been, have consistently shown to produce racist outcomes, right? So uh, it's less accurate when used on, on people with darker skin color. Um, and, and a very popular online proctoring tool that has been adopted by many education institutions during the pandemic was Proctorio. Uh, and there, have been, there has been research has shown that black students have been reported that the system were unable to detect their faces. Um, and as a result, students with darker skin have to shine more light on themselves to verify their identities uh, and to take their exams with a light in their face. Um, Dutch universities also adopted this software um, 
because a lot of this research has come from the US, and I think this is the point that I want to draw when you talk about discrimination, when you talk about racism, uh, and I don't mean just by color, I also mean wider conversations of discrimination, uh, but particularly on race, that the narrative is often that it is a very US thing, right? That this doesn't really happen in Europe. Um, so anyway, coming back to the case, um, Robin, who is this student, um, also faced this exact same thing with a Dutch university. Uh, you know, it locked her out of the, in the middle of the exam uh, because she, the software thought that she was no longer at the computer. So she just she was doing her exam halfway and then she got locked out. Um, her, her identity couldn't be verified. And we're currently supporting an official complaint at the Netherlands Institute of Human Rights. Uh, she came to us because her university largely ignored her experience and her distress. Um, so we were at a hearing yesterday, and I think that was why also I wanted to draw in this example. Um, I won't go into details of, of what happened. Um, it's still in the process of it. But I think on one hand, you see that uh, when we first submitted a complaint to the university, they claimed that they, claimed that they will do an external investigation into Proctorio. Uh, but uh, a big uh, um, um, media outlet found out that this investigation was actually con conducted by an auditor hired by Proctorio themselves, right? So the result of the audit was just, well, the software is not discriminatory, and of course the, the university didn't do anything more than that. Um, and so far, they, the university also had, had claimed that, like, well, we are not responsible for it uh, uh, because they could not find an objective relationship between Robin's skin color and the problems she has experienced with proctoring. Um, this obviously makes no sense. Um, and I want to draw these two key points because I think um, on one hand, when you look at the AI Act and you, look at, and you think about self-assessment, I think this case is in, in, a, in a weird way evident in the sense that if you ask companies to self-assess, I don't think that is an effective tool. And then what happens when that that assessment or that audit is say, okay, this is not discriminatory. And secondly, I think it's also an example of the larger context of education and the privatization of digital infrastructures we, we see across all areas and the idea of responsibility, right? And where does that responsibility lie? Um, despite the fact that it has already been a lot of evidence and research that show that Proctorio is discriminatory against students of color, large institutions and large power structures still refuse to admit that this could be uh, an issue. So even when it's, in, it's known in cases that, that software does discriminate, I think that it doesn't matter whether you have that evidence or not, because there are these large forms of, of, of power, where the institutions, where the governments, or et cetera, will, will kind of find ways around it. And I think the one thing um, that I want to draw actually coming from uh, Andrea's discussion and perhaps also maybe being a bit controversial uh, is that the larger question, because I mean, there's a lot of talk about Europe and a lot of talk about, a lot about European regulation. Um, but I think what does it mean uh, to be European and who is, who is counted within this idea of Europeanness, right? Because if taking the issue of racism and discrimination seriously, you have to, I think, take the larger picture of reckoning with Europe's own colonial histories and how violence can still be enacted upon racialized and marginalized groups of people within and outside of its borders. And I think when we think of technology, when we think of regulating technology, it's always very easy to focus on that. And I understand some benefits to that, uh, but it also cannot be separated from the historical and I think current social political climate in, in, in which we're in. So when we talk about uh, I think Andrea ended it with like, yeah, what are the processes of decision making? Who are allowed to be in these spaces, whether in the digital rights spaces, whether in the European policy making spaces? Um, I think that is a big question in which I, I feel has to also talk about the histories that, that of exclusion that comes with the European uh, project. Um, I might end here. I think I, Simona or uh, Andrea, I'm not sure whether I've kind of gone too long, but maybe I, it no. might make sense and then we can carry on. No, it's perfect. Thank you, Jill. Yeah. Um. So b before giving floor to the, to the audience and uh, grabbing from this uh, self-assessment idea, uh, which I may explain a bit for the people that are not familiar, there is a very important tendency in the EU uh, 
regulation or policies, etc., to say it's it's old. Huh? It's not only about the digital. Is that the big fish or the industry or the private actors? Uh, we will just tell them some best practice, and they will self-assess the, themselves. We tell them that they shouldn't be nasty, and they will verify to not be nasty, and everything will, will be okay, right? This is there is a, a very heavy weight in the in the in the regulation about this. And this is bring me to, a converse, uh, to uh, an actor that I would like to uh, briefly describe, ask you to describe. In the, in the lobby, in the, the, there is a lot of lobbies lobbying on the digital sphere. It's enormous. If you check in the internet, you will see how much money the big techs spend only in lobbying in, in, uh, in the uh, European Commission. So I would like you briefly to, to, to explain a, a bit your experience in uh, the, um, in your experience some, uh, where, where they are pushing more, or even if it's just an anecdote or, or something small, but just to have this idea that it's not just the policy and us, but is, uh, there is a, a percentage. Uh, uh, Corporate Europe um, is an organization that I like very much that I've, I've uh, collected uh, data on, uh, on the lobby effort, and uh, there is one, the, the commission here, one, uh, uh, about the older, the meeting they have, one fourth is civil society and all the rest is private lobbyists. So it, there is a very big imbalance between private interest and a common and, uh, and common interest and digital uh, rights. So I don't know who want to start. Jill, Jill, she looks very convinced. Do you have something to say right now? Or, or I have Andrea an can start. No worries. Yeah, please, please go. Uh, I went, okay. So um, I'm gonna get into travel. So uh, Arnau, we're definitely gonna speak later. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, well, I always like to say that Brussels is a is a very small town. Um, just for you to to know, I don't really think that the European quarter in Brussels is l bigger than El Raval. It's a very, very, very tiny space. And you have so many interests converging in there. So you have not only like representations for each European country, but also representations from each country in the world, international organizations, big companies. And big companies, they are normally present in several forms, so they have like different shapes. They have the shape of them being in their own form, and they come in the shape of business associations that they really influence. They come in the shape of often, here's the, here's the travel, fake NGOs. And uh, they also come in the shape of, uh, of independent consultants or consultancy firms. And I think that um, I work at a think tank right now, and we work really, really close to the European institutions, but even though we have a .eu-like name, our funding doesn't come 100% from the European institutions. They come from a variety of factors, like private foundations. So for us, for example, like we have like a, this like Belgium National Foundation giving us money, as well with some some others, which is like fine, and they have like very like strict um, like ethical and transparency standards. But of course, we we open our membership to private companies, and even though we have done a very good job in like trying to keep some companies out or some interest out or to have like some best practices and guidelines for example we never have it's really rare for us to launch a project with only one sponsor and we always like try to have i mean it's not try it is a must either you're doing that or it's not going to happen civil society academics and experts and you have private sector and you have public institutions you need to tick those four boxes in order to launch something which is very nice but as i said when uh, there's like certain pieces of, leg of legislation being discussed in that very, very long process that I described, uh, companies are, not, are definitely going to try to influence the process one way or another. They're going to try to lobby. They're going to try to lobby personally because it's a village, so sometimes your, your kid goes, goes to school to, to one important person like doing like something, so you're going to try to influence people directly, or you're going to try to influence processes. And if you're a company, you're going to try to influence the processes that are seen as independent. So 
the European institutions are doing a good job in trying to see, okay, we are trying to get influenced by this and that, but it is true that when things get heated up, um, they simply have too much money. So here's my anecdote after all this disclaimer. We were discussing, um, I mean, when DSA, DMA came out, there were lots of things in so many topics, and one of them that really touched us um, on a personal level was the issue of cybersecurity. So basically, these big companies were saying, I cannot make my services interoperable with other like, company services, because that's going to compromise encryption, which is something that really makes me laugh. But um, anyway, so they were like trying to go against this idea of interoperability based on cybersecurity concerns. And at the moment, um, we were looking for, uh, for funding for a project on cybersecurity in this big company. And I think that since there's only big five, you can imagine which one of the big fives or big three uh, was, uh, was really active and came to us. And, and, and it was like, hey, I have this very nice project about better regulation. Like, we're going to, I think it would be very interesting to, to see where regulations clashes. OK, I mean, that sounds interesting and it's very useful. Um, we can look it into. And uh, this company came with, uh, with a person because uh, obviously we didn't, it wasn't the company like telling us, hey, I have the money because I want you to do that. It was an old colleague of us who went to the private sector a few years ago. So she came to us and said, like, hey, I'm very interested in like, making some kind of partnership with you again. I want to be an associate in some form. And for you to, to review my candidacy to become an associate, here's a project that we can do together. It's like, really well financed and it's on a, on a topic that I know you're like, looking fun into. So, for us, it was like very interesting. Like, of course, somebody we trust, she worked with us before, we are looking for funding, and she comes with a project, so of course we're going we're gonna to move on. And then uh, I remember like, sitting back with my boss, and I'm like, hey, isn't it too easy? What's wrong? What happened? So what, what happened is like this big company was like obviously trying to lobby into us because we have a good name to lobby on their behalf without us knowing that we were lobbying on their behalf. By offering us, uh, theoretically neutral topic that we wanted to discuss on, but that they could use, like, hey, this institution who you all really trust, because you all are, you're funding it, uh, has said this about this topic. Come on, like, you really need to take that thing out of the re regulation, because everybody's like saying that it's really going to compromise that. So well, that happens more often than you can even imagine. And that, if, that happened to me. Um, and I'm sure that everybody has done it, or like personal offers, because I'm an, indep I'm an independent. I normally, I mean, I don't have like a contract that says, hey, you work with this institution 100% of your time, all the time, or I'm going to fire you. So they come to you and say, hey, why don't you just like co-write the paper, come to a conference or like something, and, um, and I don't know, just like discuss it. You don't even need to just like sign it, just like be present. And because you're present, you're seen with a logo, like everything, all automatically they will use your image to try to support something. So the lobby industry, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting. It's the bad one from Harry Potter, right? Like it, it just like tries to take like many shapes and forms, and like yeah. can be like your best friend or not. So <laughs> takes I'm many shapes. Well. Many many shapes. I'm not sure, Jill, if you had like something similar. I'm sure you have. I think it's also very similar in academia, right? I think particularly oh, yes. in the fields of computer science, that's for one, but also in law. I mean, I think that's also there's a big debate on corporate funding uh, in knowledge production, uh, the types of questions that will be shaped, right? So it's never really too explicit in the sense of, I mean, there are obviously cases in which, okay, they try to veto certain forms of articles, but it's also very um, subtle, um, such as shaping the questions that they want uh, to be answered, um, and also giving large sums of money to uh, renowned academics. Uh, there have already been so many cases at Oxford with, uh, and Uber reports, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's also just like you said very much, uh, tied to your experiences that academia or, or public education is also, uh, well, ho hollowed out of, of more funds. So there's this reliance on uh, external funding and external sources of, of money uh, to kind of keep, keep the, the, the thing going. So I do see very similar parallels, uh, particularly in, in, in this field where I think you also mentioned earlier that um, because there's such, um, there's so many regulatory proposals on the table, that people with significant resources will be able to tackle them, but those who don't will have to pick their battles of which regulation they're going to channel their mm -hmm. efforts to. And I think this completely skews the, the, the game. Um, and I, I also know, I think in terms of lobbying, that 
I think right now, I think in general, I think was it the EU Transparency Register or it was maybe a corporate Europe observatory, which maybe Simona mentioned about like, there's about like 100 million a year on lobbying, which I think it's not a lot compared to like oil and gas in the past, but that they see a pickup in this, right? In, in all the new regulations uh, that are coming in. Um, and maybe just a point of, maybe that the title of, of this, um, this, this session, which I also feel interesting because I think it's something we, we, we talk about a lot, which is that our regulation is slower than the speed of, of technological development, right? Um, this kind of lagging law assertion and notion. Um, but then what, what you see actually and related to lobbying is that central to the business models of many of these tech companies are, are practices of, of regulatory ar arbitrage. So uh, yeah, self-defining as a tech company to avoid regulations, for example, or misclassifying uh, in the labor context, misclassifying workers uh, to avoid employment law, and also regulatory entrepreneurship, which shows that um, relying on actively changing and shaping the law rather than just operating in kind of like legal gray zones. So in that sense also, um, it's maybe sometimes not that the law is catching up, but actually legal developments have been happening in the background. Uh, and, and, and also the second point is that maybe the speed of tech development should slow down instead of laws going faster. Uh, but that I will end there. Yeah, thank you. So I think the floor is for the audience now. If you have any questions or, or something you want to say, please let us know. A part of the audience here, Jill, is under terrible sun. They are melting, so maybe this is why their brain is melting. This is why maybe they don't have much questions. But the rest, the one that are in the shadow, do you have any question? Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, I would like to ask about what do you think or what tips will you share with uh, organizations that want to start working on European level for advocacy because it's so hard but it's <laughs> I don't know I think the national organizations need to start be more present in Brussels and also about how to connect maybe advocacy in the national level to to influence in the in the Brussels I don't know it's just mm. if you have any tips or recommendations thanks okay maybe I can go I can go first for the general picture and then for the advocacy part of thing I can give the floor to Jill because she'll be better positioned than me um, I think that if you want to have an impact in Brussels, you need to make a good partnership with somebody. Because there's like so many interests and so many different companies and places going in and out that you really need to have a name in order to be heard. And the best way for you to have a name is to partner with somebody who has a name. So um, this is not selling my own work, I promise, but um, on the, I'm not sure yet of the date, but end of November, beginning of December, we are going to organize, we are like organizing at the moment, a big event because there is uh, two Euro um, German foundations that wrote a really interesting paper called Digital Empowerment and it, they, are, they offer like five tips for um, improving like the regulatory landscape in, in Brussels and they made specific things related to data protection and GDPR. So they came to us, for example, and they were like, hey, this is my report with, we want to, um, I mean, we really want to make the European institutions like hear what we have to say. What can we do? We, um, they have really like, partnered with like some institutions in France and they were going to present the report in Paris. They had done it in, in Berlin they're like Germans, they're like, hey, but what, what can we do in Brussels? So what we are doing with them is like, okay, we have this program called Connecting Europe. And that basically says that if you're like working on certain topics that are good for the European democracy, um, you can come to us and then like we can like try to see what we can do together. So in this sense, I mean, obviously you ticked all the boxes. So if you're doing something that is innovative, you're like bringing new ideas from outside of Brussels, of course we're interested in helping you out. So what we are doing is like we are creating a, like, an, an event in which we will like invite like top level like EU officials from like different institutions, civil society, and probably journalists, we're going to skip the corporates this time, and we're going to put them together in the same room, and we're going to give these people like the floor to say, okay, this is our report, this is our, like, our recommendations, and then we're going to have a panel discussion with a member from the, from the European Parliament or, or Commission, like, you know, institutions and like people like that. And in that way, after that, you're going to have a chat with them informally over a drink, and to some extent, your name is already been there. But the problem is that when you start 
partnerships is important, like such as this thing that we're doing with these institutions. The, the second one, I cannot pronounce the name because I'm, my German is like non-existent. But the first one is called the New Institute, and it's and they're starting to do like really interesting things in Germany. So what so what we're doing is like okay, so we're using like our platform for you to have a voice in this sense. But what comes after that? I think that's a difficult thing because London in Brussels it's easy. You just like need to to say okay where are we landing? But then like how do you continue your work? Because after you, many many new things are going to land, and then people are going to forget it. And then if you want to really make an impact, you need to have a presence. And I think that for the advocacy like part, I'm going to give Jill the floor because I'm sure she'll she'll be like better positioned. But like starting is easy. The hard thing is to stay. I think um, for me the okay so. The racism in tech center is also just very much based on um, trying to ground it in local context. And every now and then, of course, we also kind of have conversations and have sustained conversations with um, advocacy groups on a European level. I think what we see a lot is the idea that to be doing European level advocacy, a lot of the times for specific kind of themes, they really need like use cases. So they really need like very concrete examples of certain things that happen. So in the context of discrimination and racism, it was very much like, okay, how can you prove that something is uh, uh, discriminating against uh, certain groups of people, etc. So part of our work is very much of like giving them some material to work with, right? So that is maybe a little bit further from the the, the this um, kind of like the the policy making process in itself. But I think it helps the policy making processes in different ways. I think that a lot of the from what I know, at least, and maybe Simona, Andrea will know better. Also, is that the idea where also recognizing um, I think Andrea said partners, but also um, other advo advocacy groups that share, I think, a very similar vision over things that you can come together and, 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 and kind of look at some of the new forms of regulation and then pick, I guess, a, a kind of angle to push forward. Because um, I think there's a lot of having to, to, to build coalitions um, across that board uh, due to kind of resources. Um, and, and I think the question is really about sustainability, right? So, so Andrea is really like, okay, at advocacy is maybe easier to start, but then how do you sustain it? And I think that is always a difficult question. I probably don't have the answers uh, for it. Um, and also maybe I think Simona might, could also share more about, about this. Mm. I, I like to add some things. So, so um, starting from what you say about the fake NGO. So uh, when the digital right, uh, I came to the digital right arena in 2006, so I was very late, respect the, the fight start in the 70s or 90s, etc. Uh, but when, well, since very few years ago, the digital right was an arena that was nobody was caring about digital. So it was great to be a digital right activist because the people they were there, they were there because they believe in it. No one will give money to any of them, so there were no reason for any corruption or, or nothing, and so the, the digital fighter uh, were there just because they want to be there. But certainly now is in the agenda, is in the political agenda. The two things, the ecology, you know, the green and the digital are in the political agenda. So certainly there is a lot of money coming there, and so there is a lot of idiots and also the bad guys also coming there. So, because the system need to have all this fake NGO, because the, when the right one were going there, in, in, uh, years ago, they, we were knocking the door and simply were digital. What, what is this? Okay, yes, okay. So, and was easy, was good, because you, we were the only one, but it was difficult. Now it's easier, because everybody speaks about digital, but together with you knocking the door, there is hundred people that they are just there to get some money or just because they are they, they they are creation fake NGO created by the system in order to say I don't I don't agree what Xnet say but this one say much better and this is what happened in all field the fight for housing in so in any field the system always need to create fake NGO in order to say that they are listening the civil society while they are just there their servant right so we have to be very careful 
of who are we uh, traveling with in this fight. And on the other hand, there is a lot of very old organizations that were already there. They, they, they have been bought by the system, because the first thing that the system does before it generates all these uh, uh, idiots and, 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 and disruptive <laughs> people around, they try to buy uh, you. So if an institution comes to you and asks you to do a report, probably they are trying to by you. So the reports sometimes are good, but if all the time they ask you to do a report, it means be careful because it means that they want to give you some money in order to shut you up because the report, of course, go in the draw. Uh, so this is the context. And to answer more straight, to, to tie in this context, is uh, that what we do, for example, that we are small but uh, old. Uh, so I think. Uh, it's important to map there is very good organization that they are already doing the, the work in the, in the so you have this mix eh, in Brussels. You have all the people there to do, to do the fake and the 10% of people doing the good. So this, you don't need to add more effort. You need to support the people that are already in the ground because mm -hmm. they can afford to, to take it for long. And also, you can do something very useful because what is decided in Europe, then it comes home. Mm -hmm. So these people can tell you, OK, for example, now with the DSI and the MADA, the very famous and important piece of legislation, the, the Digital Service Act already ju the, mm -hmm. uh, was just uh, Published, finished. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there is a lot of things that when it comes to the ground to uh, each of our country, we have to be careful in how it's implemented. So it's easier, of course, if you can be there, if you can have one person in, Bel in, in Brussels doing, the, doing your lobby work and, and mapping all the time, perfect. If you can pay for one person to be there, it's great. But if you cannot, you can rely, you have to first check who are the good one, you are the fake one, and, and then you can ask them how you can help when the, the things come here in order to, that the implementation is not destroying, to, to fix what you can fix in the legislation. And sometimes if you're partnering with the bad ones, or at least knowing who they are, it's useful, because you will be able to see what, like, what topic are they going to go for next. If you're like trying to get in advance that information, that sometimes is really useful for you to prepare. Like, okay, they're going to try to lobby in this place. Okay, I know that whatever I hear about like this topic in particular, I need to double check, because there's like emerging interest in this topic. But I agree with everything you said, and it's becoming like more more, more of a presence, like especially like right now the UK is out, you have no idea how many UK institutes um, and everything it's opening in Brussels all of a sudden, like they're like sending one person because every, it's, as I mentioned, there's like, I mean, we all know each other and I've been there for like not that long. It's, it's really, really tiny. We all go to the same gyms, we all go to the same bars, we all have like lunch in the same restaurants, we sleep in the same hotels, everything is the same. So uh, everything is decided by a really like, tiny group of people who have like these cognitive biases that we have because all we hear, it's always the same. So and sending ideas is more And I think it's important, there is a lot of uh, organization very, very nice in many fields that now they open the, their digital sector in their organization, which is great because it's important. But often, and I, uh, some reports are useful. I don't want to say that all the reports are bad. Some reports are very useful. But what I suggest to this organization is to try to understand uh, the field. And instead of repeating reports, repeating analysis, Everything has been done in the last 70 years, so there is a lot of material, and, uh, and so it's better to check what we have to defend. The hacker says you, we should never solve a problem twice, so everything is already there. So uh, it's better to, to uh, support one another. Uh, so if you find someone saying exactly what you want to defend, it's better that you support, you, you give the attribution and you support this work than not spending time recreating the same work. So, any other question? So, th uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, as you explained so brilliantly, uh, lawmaking is slow when compared to the tech world. And when, you're, when, when we rush uh, uh, law, law writing, 
we don't usually love the, the laws that are written and there are lots of agents influencing on, on, that, on that process. So I'd like to know if there are any ideas of things that even if they are long term and they are difficult to achieve, we can work on so that process gets slightly quicker, slightly better and resilient to the influence of those people, those big companies. I'm not sure. Huh. Hmm. Well, first of all, I really like shadow people because you are making all the questions. So, sunny people, come on. <laughs> um, I think that when you, I mean, I, I, I've known Simona already for, for a few years, really, and I know that the work she does here in Barcelona is really remarkable. And I think that's an example, for example, an example, for example, to influence things happening at other levels of policy. I think that when you start things from scratch from the local level and you team up and you like set your ideas forward and you say, hey, this and this and this is where the things that I care about, you're somewhat prepared when the regulatory process starts because you have already like, you know your ideas, you know what it's right for you and it's not acceptable for you. So I think it's easier to put things forward. But but I think it's it's all about like keeping your eyes open and uh, knowing that you really have to participate. There are participatory processes because of something and companies are always going to fill it in. They are always going to say what they think about a specific proposals because they have teams designed to do that. And civil society do, does not have the support, financial sometimes, um, that is like really useful for you to have time to read those proposals, but also like organizational support, like once something comes out, for you to know, okay, this that we were fearing happened, or hey, super nice, this we wanted and we achieved, and it's still like continue throughout the regulatory process that, as I, as I said, takes years. Jill, do you want to add something on that? Yeah, I think it's it's a it's a good question, but also a really tough one, right? And I think um, the the question is also why are we regulating and what are we regulating for? Um, so I don't think it's also just about. And I think if you think of the GDPR, I think that's a really good example to look at because um, regulation is also not just about settling with the final regulation. There are issues of enforcement, there are issues of compliance, it's a whole process, right? And, and, and if you have so many regulatory proposals on the table, what happens uh, after it, it gets passed? And, and who still gets to shape and ensure that the laws are enforced? Because the law is not just a piece of paper. What is it a law in practice? And I think when you look at the GDPR, and, and I think, I, I think the, the idea of European regulation is also very much an external tool into influencing geopolitics, etc. Um, so I think when we think about regulation, I think looking back at existing ways in which we regulate, where are the shortcomings? I mean, the GDPR has been in effect since 2018 and there's still a bunch of enforcement problems. There's still a bunch of issues with EPAs, et cetera, et cetera. So I think instead of, in that sense, looking forward, it's like looking back and seeing mm -hmm. How can we design better instruments and not just at the, the first stage of, of how that instrument is uh, shaped? Well, very important. I do feel that there should be also emphasis on, on the later part of this process. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, all I can give for now. Any other question? More shadow people. Well, you're half shadow. Half the shadow, shadow people <laughs> can speak, the other people cannot articulate word. Yeah, um, for me, just um, a broader vision of the battleground, because you describe it as such. You spoke a lot about enemies and basically about companies, but who are your allies? Um, who are the stakeholders of this fight, if you may give a, a broader vision to us? I've never said the word enemy because I don't want to get into trouble. Um, I did say corporate many times, that is true. Uh, stakeholder. A stakeholder is any interested party. And um, if you go to the basic definitions, which are not my definitions, because for me, everybody, even like a citizen who has never heard of something, should become a stakeholder. Um, when we speak about that, we normally speak of civil society associations, which can be like, I don't know, like a dad's and mom's association at school, or like a bigger civil society digital rights association. Size is like, doesn't really matter. Then you have 
um, like of course um, experts and academics, and some of them they're like very into the regulatory process, and it's like really easy to see people with hybrid backgrounds, like they have a position in academia and they teach about a certain things, but they are like very interested in following the topic, and we can see it in technology more than ever because there's like lots of people interested in AI or other techs, and they're like following that, and they're like do using their academic background to influence the regulatory process from a policy perspective. Of course, you have like corporates, but you also have like NGOs and think tanks, and in I don't know, like it's even like governments and public institutions can can really submit things. So I think that is multi-stakeholder is like the most vague word you can find, but everybody that has an interest, because either they're going to be um, affected or in a good or in a bad way, or they're going to be impacted by whatever comes out, and they have a, a right to say something. Jill? Um, I think for me, I don't know, I think the framing of enemy is always uh, maybe a bit... Um, like that's an inside and outside kind of antagonism. I think mm. I, I want to re really more speak from the perspective of um, not just, uh, for example, what Andrea said, um, tackling, say, private companies, but I think also larger institutions at large, right? And I think Simona mentioned early on about, or maybe Andrea, about uh, doing things in a human way or trustworthiness. And I think when you think from the perspective of policy making and when you think of the perspective of trust and, and, and issues of inclusion, um, Brussels is very white. Uh, it's also shown the absence uh, and lack of, 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 of different forms of marginalized people in discussions around tech policy making, despite the EU expressing its commitment to anti-racism and inclusion. I don't know whether these people will think of the institutions as an enemy. I'm just saying that the, when we think of what is an enemy or not, I think it's also looking inwards of like who is included and who is not. Um, so I, I do think in that sense, um, if we look from that perspective of, of, of policy making, uh, having an absence of these people um, will also mean that and not taking the realities and lived experiences of these people directly impacted by, by technologies will lead to, in my view, poor regulation, uh, legislation uh, where developers and, com and private companies and even governments uh, in that sense self-assess what a high-risk AI application could be. Um, and I, I do think that I wouldn't position so much as who is the enemy, but really who is existing, not already included in some of these discussions. Yeah. I like to add that uh, I look very young, but in fact I am uh, an activist since uh, already 42 years. And when I start my acti uh, activism, I, I start, of course, us and them, us against them. But now, after a long time and a lot of experience, I think it's not about us, about them. I, I, uh, I have a, a course, I direct a course in the uh, University of Barcelona based on the Sturgeon theory. Sturgeon is a, a, um, a writer, science and fiction writer, that says something which is, for me, the base of everything. He says that 90% of everything is junk. So this gives us a clue on how to behave in life and in activism, which is we have uh, the, the good news is not the 90% of junk, but the 10% that is not the junk. So you have this 10% everywhere. In activism, you have a 90% of junk and a 10% of good. In uh, politicians, you have a 90% of junk and 10% of good. In institutions, the same. So if you, are, if you apply this in your day, and it's not a joke because it works, I, I, really, I really tell you. So you have to find the 10% inside of the EU uh, uh, institution people, 10% of people, any, almost any political party, not exactly everything, but uh, almost know, everything. We're going to edit that because I think I'm going to respond to that with very specific things. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> you have a 10% yeah. politician, you have to, they, they are the one you can work with. Even in the one you think they are the enemy, but you need to have some mm -hmm. conversation with them. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have 10% of activists, the 90% that they, they mm -hmm. are useless, they do reports, it's okay. They are busy doing reports, but the 10% are doing the real thing. And so these 10% are the ally. And 
and what uh, a lie about what uh, because they are funnier but also because probably they are really fighting for digital rights and not for other strange reason. There is a 10% of people that really like the fight and the transformation because, because of, the, of the, the, the passion of, of doing the transformation. So sometimes you can find this mm. in, in very strange places, but this will make mm. all this effort that we, we, were, we are talking here possible. So you, you don't know, you have to you have to not trust where you think is the good, and, uh, and, and you have to trust more where you consider the enemy, because sometimes there you find the step to go further. Simona, if I may, and I'm going to bring Jolene to here, you were speaking about 10% of good, and I think that one of the things and issues that we see forthcoming and that we are all, on a personal level, battling against is facial recognition. And when you go to the European institutions, and I'm bringing Jill because she mentioned this, uh, this uh, example that she's like currently working on about fi uh, discrimination um, when it comes to facial recognition or like this type of software. Um, in the European Parliament, there's like one group that's like actively working against it, which is the Greens. And they launched a campaign against facial recognition. And here comes the thing that I want to bring out of the thing. Um, facial recognition is going to happen in discussions I mean, I was speaking to one of the colleagues one of the of, of my friends here in the in the audience before that uh, the European Parliament is going to hold a vote on tw the 28th of October for the AI Act and one of the things that they were discussing is facial recognition and there has been like a huge debate about that and um, at the beginning the aim was we're going to ban facial recognition. We're going to ban these things because they're unacceptable at the European level. And there were like other things on the, on the shopping list, which were like, for example, social credit systems, so on and so forth. The Green has launched the campaign. There is lots of things about it. Um, we all know by a fact that facial recognition is going to be allowed in Europe. Just that's the end of the debate. And uh, we know it, and I know it, from the discussions I had with the different political groups in relation to this AI Act, in relation of the vote that is going to happen the 28th, that nothing is going to come out of that, no consensus, things like that. Jill mentioned high-risk systems, definition of AI, many other issues on the table that we're not getting consensus on. But everybody takes for granted that the technology is out, the technology is being put into place, you're not going to ban it. And these are like the things that relate to your like 90-10% rule. And we need to partner, and I think with the 10%, they're like doing things that for us matter, and we need to do it from an anticipatory perspective, because when the technology is out and it's been proven, it has been tested, whether it's more effective or less effective, we see it as a technical program. And I think the Jill relates to that, and that's why I wanted to bring her on board. When, it, when something that is not ethical to use becomes something that you can fix by arranging the database, by like changing some kind of process within, it's not something unacceptable anymore. It is a mistake, a technical mistake. And when you think of technology as something that can be fixed, then why are you going to just like keep pushing to ban a certain use? You're just going to use it and try to fix or mitigate the risks. Yep. And Jill, Jill maybe you I think come? this yeah. for you, the last word, mm -hmm. the last word of this session is for you, so all the responsibility to, for the closing <laughs> doors. <laughs> so this is uh, the moderator ass asserting her, her moderating power. Um, I, this is a tough one because you, you, you both have said really, really good points. So I'm not sure how to end it, really. I think, I think I really want to come back to Simona's earlier point in, in all, all the work that we do. I think particularly as the digital or the technology is really uh, the, the ways in... No, as it becomes more popular, right? And I think really this idea of what does it mean to be working on this field uh, in this field um, and also taking the resources uh, because uh, we work on digital stuff and I, I think I really want to highlight this because when we speak to you know anti-racist organizations or other organization organizations on the ground it's very clear that like a lot of funding is going into something that calls itself technology or AI or etc and this happens across many levels right and I think I think be, if we are con, like concerned about change, I think also a lot of it is also looking inwards at our own uh, position within that space. Whose resources are we taking up? Whose resources are we not taking up? Uh, and what kind of work do we want to emerge out of that? I think sometimes it's always very easy to look outwards. And, and of course, there's a lot of 
things that have to happen outwards, but I think there's a lot of things that also happen within uh, our own spaces. And I really want to call for that kind of reckoning and, and, and understanding of where do we stand in this space and how do we ensure that for the voices that we want to uplift, that we're not building everything from scratch. That is really what uh, Simona mentioned. We have to build on each other and the work that has come before us. And I think in that chase, we, we get very caught up. Uh, with many things, and I, I think I want that critical reflection to 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 be an ongoing process uh, amongst all the work that we're doing. Thank you very much, Jill. That's it.